Allora cominciamo questo incontro, buongiorno a tutti, sono Juan Carlos De Martin, sono qua in, in veste di diversi cappelli, però fondamentalmente come delegato del rettore per i servizi bibliotecari, benvenuti. L'incontro come sapete si terrà in inglese, abbiamo un ospite degli Stati Uniti, dico solo due parole iniziali in italiano. Eh, L'incontro durerà fino alle 11 e l'obiettivo di questo incontro chiaramente è di presentare l'open access per chi ancora non lo conoscesse e poi comunque discutere perché open access, quali sono gli ostacoli, a che punto siamo, cosa si potrebbe fare. Però ci sono anche dei posti qua, se vuole. Ok, let's start in English. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome, actually back to Torino, Professor Steve Schieber. Uh, he was already here in uh, 2010 when we did, uh, together with the Berkman Center at Harvard, uh, a conference on university and cyberspace in June 2010, so welcome back. And uh, Professor Schieber is um, uh, one of those uh, colleagues that is, uh, if I really wanted to make a detailed presentation, it would take actually too much time, so I would just say a few words. Uh, in, on his website, he has a very nice way of capturing the essence of what he does, because he says he's a professor of computer science. So I'm a computer engineer, so we are close. And um, he's a computational linguist and a library aficionado. These are the three sentences you find on his website. And uh, let me say a few words for all these three, uh, with the remark that is the third one that is going to concern us this morning. Because the first one, Professor of Computer Science, the official title is James Welch and Virginia Welch, Professor of Computer Science at the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Harvard University. And he has a remarkable, outstanding career in computer science, uh, going back to his PhD from Stanford University in 1989, and awards uh, of various kinds, honorary chairs, uh, fellowships, and so on, very distinguished career. Computational linguist, uh, of course, uh, the, this sentence is linked to the open access repository of Harvard University, which is called DASH which stands for Digital Access to Scholarship at Harvard, so if you want to understand more about the computational linguistic side of Professor Schieber, just go to Dash and see what he published. But it's the third point that is uh, taking us together this morning, which is Library Aficionado. Uh, aficionado is actually a Spanish word I use also in English, meaning somebody who's enthusiastic about libraries. We are in a library, this is the main library of the engineering school at the Polytechnic of Turin and uh, his involvement with libraries, with books, uh, with uh, publishing is uh, complex, but I will only mention that he has been involved uh, from uh, 2000, uh, approximately 2005, 2006 uh, with an investigation at Harvard University about the future of scholarly publishing. And that led in 2008 uh, to two very remarkable events. One is the um, uh, Open Access Mandate of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, uh, which made worldwide news, and at the same time the founding of the Office for Scholarly Communication at Harvard uh, University. He was the founding director and now is the faculty director. So, he's here today to talk about open access. We have been doing uh, our part of the Polytechnic of Turing with establishing our open access repository, and we keep working on open access. Uh, where is Nicoletta? Nicoletta is there is my main ally in doing, uh, of bringing open access forward with many librarians present in this room. And uh, so the, the topic today is open access. Why open access? What is the motivation? Where, where, uh, which is the direction we should follow? Which are the obstacles? Which are the opportunities we should uh, seize? And uh, Professor Shib is going to make a presentation and then we reserve some time at the end in order to make a conversation uh, with any questions that you might have. So, welcome back to Torino, Stuart, Professor Stuart Schieber. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to, uh, to speak here in uh, the library of the Polytechnic. I want to thank Juan Carlos de Martin for, uh, for uh, inviting me and for all of you uh, 
for coming. Well, I thought, as my caller said, I thought I would um, start by talking about uh, some issues related to open access. And um, uh, having thought about open access now for many years, if I start talking about open access, I'll just keep talking for a few hours. So my recommendation would be as questions arise or, or issues arise, feel free to just stop me and we'll talk about that. Because <clears throat> otherwise I'll talk about what I'm interested in and you may be interested in something else. So it's better if it, if it turns into at some point a more, for, a more informal uh, discussion. I have uh, uh, slides and, and, and so forth and I can just keep talking indefinitely. Um, but I'll do a little bit of background uh, on, um, on open access and, um, and where I hope uh, things will go and perhaps why, um, uh, just to kind of set the stage. So I want to start with some first principles. Um, and the first first principle uh, that gets discussed a fair amount is this idea that research that's publicly funded should be available as widely as possible to the public. This, I think, is a, ought to be a uh, completely uncontroversial uh, uh, claim. I, I don't know anyone on any, in any aspect of scholarly publishing who would disagree with the idea that research should be available as widely as possible. The only issue is, what does as widely as possible mean? What's the best way to get the broadest possible uh, distribution? And people have honest disagreements about what that is. Let me clarify a little bit. So the idea here is that we shouldn't be providing funds, public funds, for secret research. There are, of course, rare exceptions. Uh, unfortunately, in the United States, these exceptions seem to be getting less rare of uh, secret research. But, uh, but that's not where uh, universities and, and research institutions tend to be concentrated. In general, grants uh, are provided, universities fund research. It's not intended to be secret. It's intended to be for the benefit of society. And, uh, being at a university, I'm especially sensitive to this because essentially all university research is publicly funded. Certainly in Italy, where the, for uh, almost entirely universities are publicly funded directly, but even in the United States, where most, research, uh, most uh, uh, universities are private, university research is still publicly funded. Some of it is publicly funded through direct grants from uh, uh, public institutions like the government. Other research is not funded by the government, but it's funded by the universities themselves, and the universities benefit from tax relief. That is, they're indirectly funded by the society itself. So one way or another, all research ends up being publicly funded, and the reason for publicly funding it is to make it available to the public. So this seems like an uncontroversial um, uh, play, with the exception of this phrase, as widely as possible. What does it mean for the research to be available as widely as possible? Well, um, back in the 1600s, with uh, the first uh, journals, this is the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London from 1665, so arguably the first scholarly scientific journal, the best way to distribute uh, the results of research at that time was to uh, engage a, a printer and uh, print up the research and, uh, and send it around to those scientists who could best make use of the research. The process of duplication was so onerous that you really needed special uh, help in distributing as widely as possible. So this was the best uh, method to do that. And it has remained the best method until relatively recently. Of course, now we have better ways of shipping information around, duplicating it and, and distributing it. Uh, we don't need to use 
uh, ink on paper uh, bound into uh, volumes, we can use uh, the internet. And um, actually, uh, as it turns out, you may know that the entire collection of papers from the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society from 1665 to 1923, that entire collection, all of which are in the public domain, of course, um, were um, released unilaterally on uh, BitTorrent by Greg Maxwell a few years ago. This is the uh, Pirate Bay page for the Philosophical Transactions. You can download the 32 gigabytes to get all 18,000 articles that have been published in the Philosophical Transactions. It'll take you, oh, uh, probably a few minutes to download all of the articles. And this was done by a single person, uh, you know, hundreds of years worth of, of articles. So you, you can tell just from this example, something has changed in how information can be distributed as widely as possible. Uh, we have uh, mechanisms now that really are fundamentally different, and the question is how best to take advantage of them. Okay, so that's the first principle is that, that research should be available as widely as possible, and we probably should take advantage of new technologies to do so. The next principle uh, is that uh, this process, whatever process we use, needs to provide important services. Uh, services that historically have been provided by journals, the vetting of the articles, the production, their distribution, their preservation, these are crucial services that the publishers have provided and they're important uh, today as they were, uh, have, as they have been over the years. This distribution process has to be financially viable. There's no free lunch. It's not free to distribute and uh, to, to, to provide these services and and, uh, and, um, and operate uh, journals. And people may disagree, but my own feeling is that the financial viability ought to be based on market mechanisms, just because I think those are the most uh, effective at providing efficiency of, uh, 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 efficiency of providing the services in return for uh, the fees that are uh, required. So certain considerations in the distribution process. And again, there can be controversy about how best to achieve this. I'll provide my own personal favorite, but people can disagree. If you do disagree, you should let me know, and then I'll convince you why you're wrong. Um, OK, so that's the second. And the third principle is that uh, this dissemination, this distribution of research results is not some kind of incidental issue. It's an inherent part of the research process. It's not something that should be left as an afterthought. We should really think about it from the beginning. And someone should be uh, responsible for making sure that it occurs. And that someone is whoever underwrites the cost of the research. If you're funding research, as a part of that process, you should be funding the dissemination of those results. We'll see how that enters into things. Okay, so I promised I would talk about obstacles, possibilities, and priorities. The obstacles being where we are, which is not an ideal situation, as those of you who are in the library know. Possibilities, where we'd like to be, and priorities of how to get there. <coughs> Now, the under, I, my own feeling is that the underlying issues that in, are involved in research dissemination are really economic issues. So there will be a fair amount of discussion of economic, the underlying economics uh, when we talk about uh, research dissemination. Okay, so right now, I just want, I want to concentrate on how, how things work now. The scholarly articles uh, are the main mode of dissemination of research results, and scholarly articles form what economists call a two-sided market. There's um, essentially two markets going on at the same time. And the publisher participates in both of them. The first market is a market between publishers and authors. The publisher uh, 
uh, provide services to authors. Services like uh, managing the peer review process and vetting of the articles, uh, production, uh, editing, um, distribution, and so forth. Uh, uh, provides those services on behalf of the author. In return, the author gives the publisher a valuable uh, commodity, namely a license to distribute the article. Uh, that license is based on the fact that the author um, because of copyright uh, uh, laws, has an exclusive monopolistic right to control distribution. And so that's a valuable right. The author transfers it to the publisher in return for receiving services. So that's half of the market. And the other half of the market, the other side, is, a, is the more traditional side between the publisher and typically a library, where the publisher provides access to the articles to the library in return for the library providing money to the publisher. And this is where the publisher recoups all the expense of operating uh, the publishing effort. So, uh, so there's this two markets going on simultaneously. And uh, the first thing to note about this situation is that this good that's being transferred from the publisher to the library, which is access, is a monopolistic good. It's owned monopolistically by the uh, publisher. Second of all, um, the picture that I show here isn't really quite accurate because it's not the library per se that uh, wants to receive the access to the articles. It's the readers, the patrons of the library, receive the access. Although it is the library that pays for the access. So notice that the purchaser of the good, the library, is not the consumer of the good, the reader. The economic term for this situation is a moral hazard. It's a moral hazard because the consumer of the good is insulated from the price, doesn't see the price. Okay. So with that as background on the structure, we can immediately see some properties of this uh, subscription journal market, this two-sided market. First, from the point of view of the place where the money is transferred. That's the, the, the market between the library and the publisher. From that point of view, the purchaser, the library, is purchasing access to journals. And uh, when there are two journals, from the point of view of the library, they are not substitutes for each other. Those of you who work in the library know this very well. If you have one journal, it doesn't mean you don't need the other journal, even if it's in the same field. In fact, arguably, journals are economic complements. Having access to one increases the value of having access to the other. Why? Because they cite each other. So when you read one, you're motivated to want to read the other, the articles that are cited in the other. So, so economists call uh, products, uh, they say products fall on a spectrum from substitutes to complements. Substitutes are products like um, Coke and Pepsi. I don't know, do you have, is there Pepsi in the other? There's certainly Coke. I know that I've seen Coke. Um, so, um, uh, you know, if you're thirsty and you have a Coke, it decreases your interest in having a Pepsi and vice versa. You don't need them both, you just need one. But complements are products like a left shoe and a right shoe. If you have one, it increases the utility of having the other. So, uh, or printers and toner cartridges. It doesn't do you much good to have one without them. So, um, journals are complements and not substitutes. From the point of view of the reader and the library. Uh, and when you have uh, complementary goods, they don't uh, participate, to the extent that goods are complementary, they don't participate in market competition. And that, of course, when you don't have market competition, that leads to inefficiency in the market. Okay. Uh, now, uh, in theory, that's true. And in practice, it's true as well. We can actually see very clear evidence of gross inefficiency on this side of the journal market. And here's just one example. I've, I've got a graph of um, uh, subscription costs per page 
of journals in a bunch of um, fields. These are, uh, this uh, uh, data is from a uh, study by Carl Bergstrom, journal pricing across disciplines. And um, uh, he looked at the differential in price per page between journals published by commercial publishers and journals published by nonprofit publishers. And it turns out that uh, uh, prices for commercial journals are something like five times higher than prices for journals published by nonprofits. This is not to say, the point of this is not to say that commercial journals are, are, are bad or they're uh, uh, problematic per se. It's just to show that any time you can divide a, a market that way and, and show these huge price differentials, you know that there's inefficiency in the market. It's just a clear sign of inefficiency. Uh, well, this is assuming that these are equivalent goods, that the commercial journals are in some sense um, comparable in quality to the nonprofit journals. But we can check that too. In fact, Carl Bergstrom looked at that too. He, he, instead of looking at price per page, he used price per citation, citation being a kind of a proxy for quality. And there it turns out that the commercial journals are 16 times, no, 15 times more expensive. 15 times more expensive than the nonprofit journals. So either way you look at it, there's gross inefficiency in this market. And it's not surprising, given that journals have, uh, are complements, not substitutes, first of all. And second of all, um, the, the good that's being sold is access. Access is a monopolistic good, as I mentioned before, and therefore you would expect that publishers who are maximizing their revenue and profit would extract monopoly rents. This is what we see. Inherently, access is a monopoly because it's based on copyright law, you know, starting from the Statute of Anne in, in 1710. So, uh, and that's the monopoly is received on the other side of the market from the authors. So, uh, along the same lines, to see evidence of this kind of monopoly rents, we can look at, for instance, and this is just a single example, the. Uh, profit margin of a large commercial publisher, Elsevier, revenues of over $2 billion, uh, publishing scholarly journals. And um, here are their uh, revenues and uh, profits. The revenues are the blue, light blue bars, and the profits are the dark blue. Uh, over a, uh, about a decade. And the line at the top is the profit margin percentage of profit, and it's been in the range of 30 to 40 percent and steadily increasing over the last decade. This during a period where uh, the economy has been terrible, and yet uh, they're still managing to maintain their revenues, increase their revenues and their profit margins. This is the wonder of selling a monopolistic good. You get to do this. Finally, the pricing uh, for uh, subscriptions is not sold by the journal. And that makes sense when you have uh, goods that are complements, not substitutes. It's sold by the bundle. And this has led to um, uh, a very interesting um, kind of market phenomenon, which I call cancellation futility. So. Um, Increasingly, there's a smaller and smaller number of larger and larger publishers covering all of the journals and selling the journals in large bundles. Portfolios of hundreds or thousands of journals. And they therefore provide prices to a bundle of journals, not a single journal. And they show vastly different prices to different buyers. They uh, execute um, perfect uh, price discrimination in their um, pricing. And so the upshot is that a library, of course it's the libraries that are buying all of the journals, libraries can find it very difficult to control their expenditures by canceling journals. If you cancel a journal, the publisher just raises the prices on the rest of the bundle. 
to compensate for the lost revenue. So um, your only solution, really, in theory, would be to cancel the bundle. But no library is, is willing to say, well, I'll cancel all of the Elsevier journals, and all of the Springer journals. So there really is no alternative to uh, paying for the, the bundle. And what you would expect here is hyperinflation in the cost of journals. As, as any journals are uh, uh, canceled, the prices on the, remainder, the remaining ones go up. And in general, the revenues are stable or increasing. Here's um, a quote from uh, a, 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 um, an article by uh, some, uh, a couple of law professors looking at uh, this issue of pricing in academic journals and this bundling. And they say that the immediate effect of bundled pricing has been to move competition from individual journals to bundles, uh, which essentially locks in the large publishers. It becomes insurmountable to compete with uh, large uh, publishers. <coughs> this, by the way, has an especially negative effect on scholarly societies. Small publishers not trying to make a lot of money, just trying to provide access to the research in their particular fields. They're finding it impossible to compete Often they sell their journals to the large publishers because they can't compete. Uh, and the conclusion, by the way, of this article is that it's quite possible that this bundling uh, mechanism actually constitutes uh, an illegal restraint of trade, although no publisher has ever been uh, sued for restraint of trade for bundled pricing. These guys think that it might, might be possible. So as I said, you would, you would expect some hyperinflation, and this is what we see. You know, here's the this middle line. Here is the um, is the uh, uh, inflation rate, roughly speaking, and the top line, growing at three times the rate of inflation, is uh, cereals expenditures. If you look not at cereals expenditures, but at the cost per cereal, it has essentially the identical uh, shape. I always found this especially interesting because, uh, so you might think if there was an efficient market, uh, that top line wouldn't be going up so fast. It would be coming roughly at the rate of inflation. Um, but actually, if you think about it, journals are not your typical good that makes up the bundle of products that goes into an inflation index. Those are things like uh, groceries, food, uh, energy prices, and things like that, physical goods. Journals are a knowledge good, and you would expect their trajectory of price to look like other knowledge goods. So for instance, um, a nice example is uh, music CDs. There's another knowledge good. And this bottom line has actually been deflating. That's the uh, cost of knowledge goods, like CDs. So it's especially striking that the prices are going hyperinflating when knowledge goods have been flat or decreasing over the last, uh, this is uh, about 20 years. So, uh, um, Okay, so here's some these economic properties of the subscription market. Journals are complements, not substitutes. Access is a monopoly. Pricing is controlled at the bundle level. We see the effects of this absolutely clearly in inefficiency, in uh, high uh, profit margins, in hyperinflation. These are signs of a non-functioning market. Okay, so that's where we are, where we would like to be. Um, well, so I said this is the structure of, of the market currently, this two-sided market, and my claim is that where we would like to be is here. <coughs> I'll do that again. We're here, and we'd like to be here. That is, the market uh, 
on the right hand side, the access market, ideally, should just go away. The publishers should just provide access to the readers. But that's not to say that the publishers are doing nothing. They're still providing the services to the author. And those are not cost free. They need to be compensated. So that market uh, should still exist and provide the funds to keep things going. That turns out to be in the interest of all of the participants, with the possible exception of the publishers. Come back to that in a second. Uh, so, uh, of course, the readers benefit from getting access, in fact, getting access to everything, not just the, the journals that the libraries have the funds to subscribe to. The authors still get the services. The authors still pay for those services, not in terms of a license, but in terms of actual money. Okay, um, so that essentially moves the money part from the right side of the market, which is uh, based on, remember, based on journals being complements, access being a the product being a monopoly, and pricing controlled at the bundle level. We move from that side of the market. Now the money would be on the other side of the market. And interestingly, on, that, on the opposite side of the market, all of the economic properties of that market are essentially the opposite of the economic properties of the subscription journal market. So whereas from the point of view of readers, multiple journals are complements, from the point of view of authors, multiple journals are substitutes. As an author, you submit your article to, uh, if you submit your article to one journal, it reduces the value of submitting it to another. In fact, it reduces the value to zero because you're not allowed to submit it to another. So there, there are rules about this. You just don't do it. So uh, journals are perfect substitutes, which means that from the point of view of that side of the market, you would expect market competition between the journals competing for the authors. And when you have uh, uh, market competition, that tends to lead to efficiency. Second of all, the good that's being sold on that side of the market, namely these, author, uh, these um, publisher services, is not a monopolistically owned good. Any journal can provide services for your article. In fact, it's a knowledge good. The, the, the services that are being provided are not physical, they're, they're kind of intellectual, and therefore there's a relatively low barrier to entry for providing these goods. That ought to enhance efficiency, uh, competition and efficiency as well. And finally, pricing is inherently controlled at the article level, <coughs> not at the, uh, not at the uh, journal level, let alone at the bundle of journals level. So uh, all an author has to, um, to, uh, to work with is a single article. So the journal has to deal with that single article, not bundles. Although I have to say, we can talk about this, publishers who work on this side of the market, so-called open access publishers, um, are trying to move from pricing controlled at the article level. Where they can. Okay, so by pricing at this very fine grained uh, level, uh, again, this promotes competition. So this is it all in theory, of course. The question is, in practice, what's the, what does this market look like? And um, and we actually have some experience uh, with with the market uh, just beginning to. There are some journals that operate this way, nothing like the number of journals that uh, operate as subscription journals. But we can start getting a sense of the competition and comparing the two uh, kinds of journals. So um, if we look at the subscription <coughs> journal market and look at subscription fees, uh, so the, the revenue model up member on the subscription journal market is, is subscription fees. Authors pay in their copyright this is converted to money by the publisher, and uh, the publisher receives revenue from the subscriptions by 
uh, virtue of the fact that they're providing access. Uh, meanwhile, they're also providing services to the publisher for some range of articles. And we can actually calculate how much revenue the average uh, article generates for a publisher, a subscription publisher. In a certain sense, um, that calculation tells you what is the value to a subscription publisher of the license it receives for a particular article. So maybe you can uh, take a guess as to what's the average revenue per article over all journals, the tens of thousands, literally tens of thousands of scholarly journals publishing articles, what on average is the uh, the value to a publisher of a single article. So I'll tell you the number and you can think about whether it's comparable to what you would have thought. It turns out to be about $5,000. Revenue per article is about $5,000. So, um, and it's very easy to calculate this number. It's actually a little above $5,000. A little controversy, but it's easy. You, you just take the total revenue for scholarly publishers per year. You divide by the number of articles they publish per year. That's the average revenue per article. By the way, this is not the value to a journal of an especially good article. Uh, so there, there are some journals where their uh, revenue per article is much higher than that. The premier uh, uh, life sciences journals uh, uh, their, their revenue per article is something like six times this. So uh, we actually have claims, I mean, there, there are statements made by uh, Nature, the journal Nature, and the New England Journal of Medicine that they, they get about $30,000 per article uh, in revenue. And obviously, there are, there, there are some journals where they're not getting anywhere near this. Uh, but on average, your average article, about $5,000. I think uh, Elsevier's revenue per article has been claimed to be in the range of $5,500 to $7,000 an article. So slightly above the average. Although it's a little hard to tell. There are different estimates for particular journals. But overall, it's easy to calculate this. So that tells you what the value is to the journal of this license uh, that they're uh, receiving in return for publisher services. That's the subscription, that's the traditional revenue model. So in the open access revenue model, this is the approach that I'm saying where, where we want to be, where all of the action, all of the money is on the author side, not the reader side. Uh, the situation looks quite different. Here we have direct payment for services. And of the several thousand um, journals that use this model, uh, typically the revenue comes from an article processing fee for articles that are accepted for publication. So if your article is accepted for publication, you pay a fee. That fee ranges from zero to about $3,000. The um, median fee of all open access journals, the median is zero. That is to say, the majority of open access journals charge no article processing fee. And of course, they charge no subscription fees either. They therefore make no revenue. Not a very good business, but that's not my problem. That's their problem. Sir, I personally don't think that's a sustainable way to make a living. But it is what it is. Uh, the mean for those journals that do charge a fee, uh, the mean seems to be around $1,200, although that's what, what I wrote when I made this slide, although it seems a little lower now. It may be more in the six dollars to $800 range. For instance, Public Library of Science, very high end, Top tier open access journal charges between uh, $1,350 to 
$2,900 for our publication fee. Uh, Biomed Central charges between $600-ish to about $2,500. Uh, Hindawi charges somewhere between zero and fifteen hundred dollars per article. These are all three are are open access publishers that are um, making money. They're they're profitable publishers. They're profitable, and yet their revenue per article is a fraction of what subscription publishers make. So. Uh, whereas the average, the average article for subscription publisher is making five thousand dollars, the highest of the high end articles, public library of science flagship journals, only generate three thousand dollars in revenue. So, one way of thinking about that is this: if we did what I'm hoping for, if all of the journals of the world instantly tomorrow changed from subscription journals to open access journals, and they all charged the highest of the highest end fee of $3,000 per article. The world as a whole, that is to say, the libraries, <laughs> would save 40% of the money. If they, uh, if, if, so this is why we would all be lucky if this happened. We should be so lucky that all the journals become open access journals. If, if, if all the journals just got $1,200, which, by the way, seems to be you can make a profit at $1,200 uh, if you operate efficiently, um, we would save, what, two-thirds, three-fourths of the cost. Not only would we save all this money, there would be universal access to all of the articles. So, I don't know. It seems like a no-brainer to me. This is, this is where we want to be. We want to be in a situation where there's an efficient, so this is, by the way, this is how you can tell there's an efficient market. Because prices are getting competed down to some plausible level, like $1,200 an article. So, um, yeah, so you just compare the two markets. Everything is, to my mind, better in the one than the other. There's, you get rid of the moral hazard. You're selling a competitive good, not a monopolistic good. The goods are substitutes, not complements. And we're already seeing price competition bringing fees down to uh, a fraction of where they currently are. Let me just pause here. The next topic is the hard topic. This is how to get there from here. So we know where we are, we know where we want to be, and the question is how to get there from where we are. But before going there, maybe I'll pause and uh, see if there's questions or thoughts or disagreements. I'd be happy to be disagreed with on this topic. I have to say, there are many people who disagree with me on this topic. They're all publishers. <laughs> and they, you know, I, if I were a publisher, well, I am a publisher, but we won't go there. Uh, if I were a publisher, uh, I would disagree too, because it's much more fun to be in a dysfunctional market. It's hard. Capitalism is hard when you actually have to compete with people. But if you're in a market where there's no competition, that's just that's just great. So I would be quite upset about the prospect of having to deal with a functioning market if I were a publisher. Nonetheless, the goal here is not to do what the publishers feel would be most beneficial to them. It's to provide as wide as possible distribution to the results of research in keeping with financial viability. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, question concerning uh your uh, the, the description of a market as a two-sided market, and uh, uh, whether there are some uh, uh, functions that the publishers are performing uh, related with uh, the 
internalization of uh, uh, externalities which uh, are taking place on the two sides of the market because in well-functioning two-sided markets you talk about the two-sided market because the, the platform is uh, maybe subsidizing one side let's say the authors to write uh, charging the other side so uh, a publisher may, may argue that actually the only I mean the, 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 the elasticity uh, to uh, prices of authors is very high authors do not want to pay and, and, and mm, Professor may agree, probably. Yeah. And uh, uh, on, on the other end of, of, of the market, uh, they have a quite a efficient technology to extract money from the library. So yeah. they are actually a good machine in uh, taking money where it is and giving money to people who, who write the article. They are not giving money, in fact, they are giving services. But at yeah. the end of the day, they, it may yeah. look convincing. So, uh, so um, You, you, you're, you're right, there, 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 there are things provided on both sides. In, in, in both of these stories, there's, there's things provided on both sides, but, um, uh, but all the money transfers hands on one or the other of the sides. So that means that one side or the other is subsidizing the opposite side. And there's no, there's no fact of the matter as to, I mean inherently as to, What's the best way to set up the market? I mean, it depends on what your motivations are. So if your motivation is to most efficiently extract money from libraries, or from not just like from, from kind of the, the scholarly ecology, then doing it on the reader side is much better. It's, it's way more effective uh, extra for extracting money. Um, so if, if, you, if you were given the job of designing the market, you would design a subscription market. But that's not necessarily our motivation. And so um, if we got to do it all over, which we unfortunately don't, um, if your motivation is um, social good, um, then you need to make sure there's financial viability, but beyond that, you're not trying to extract the most, the most money. Now, there is the issue that if you operate on the author side of the market, you still need to provide services to readers. And um, so you're doing essentially cross-subsidy there. That $1,200 or $2,000 or whatever it is, not only has to pay for the services to the author, it has to pay for the services to all of the readers uh, including distributing copies of the articles to the readers and maintaining uh, the online presence that the readers make use of and preserving the articles in perpetuity, the kind of archival function of journals, which readers don't see in the near term but might see in the long term. All of these things have costs associated with them and that cost has to come from the other side. Um, and, you know, how you make sure that the money is being used for that is another question. Uh, so I'm not sure if I answered your question really. I mean, and you're right that it's that the current situation is very efficient uh, or effective at extracting money from the library. The problem is it's too effective. I mean, that's why you see hyperinflation. So the uh, uh, it's extracting more money than the social social good, which is not a sign of an efficient market. Okay, so, so now comes the hard problem, which is um, how do we get from a situation uh, with a clearly dysfunctional market, gross hyperinflation of subscription journal prices that shows no sign of abating to a situation where journals operate uh, in a kind of financially viable open access approach. And I'm sad to say that I have no answer to this question. This is the really, this is the really hard uh, uh, question. Um, 
in my more cynical moments, I think I don't actually, we don't have to have an answer to this question uh, because of a, a relatively well-known law of economics called Stein's Law. So if you, if you, if you actually, maybe I'll um, go back to this slide. <laughs> this slide depicts the, the hyperinflation of, uh, of journals. So these uh, 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 year on year, uh, we have journal prices increasing at, uh, I don't know, 5 or 7%, something like that. So you get exponential real increase in the costs of journals. And so, of course, you know that exponentials, the uh, uh, budgets are not growing exponentially. So um, if you have an exponential increase in costs, but not an exponential increase in budgets, eventually the costs outgrow the budgets. And this is where we come to Stein's law. Stein's law says, uh, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. So this cannot go on forever, and so we know it will stop at some point. We just don't know when. It could be next year, it could be 20 years from now, but it will stop. So in my more cynical moments, I think we don't have to worry about how to do the transition because at some point this will stop, and at that point we'll, we'll do something better. Um, and mostly I am pretty cynical, but sometimes uh, sometimes I like to think about maybe there's something we can do to get out front of the problem. So here's the situation that we're at. The status quo is that there are something like 25,000 subscription journals. Uh, Whereas the number of open access journals is much smaller. Depends on how you count. You know, all these things depends on how you count. If you look at the directory of open access journals, I think it lists something on the order of 8,000 or 9,000. Say 9,000 journals. There's a lot of things listed there that you might not really want to propose as exemplars of journals. The number of journals uh, listed there that actually charge a publication fee is on the order of one or two thousand, I think. Um, I just took a number, picked a number that was kind of between those, so say five thousand ish journals. The, the, the number is crucial. Maybe about five thousand open access journals that someone would be willing to really entertain dealing with. On the other side, you have something like 25,000 journals, subscription journals listed in these large uh, journal uh, listings, all ricks and things like that. So it's a tiny fraction uh, of, of, of the journals. Um, the subscription journals, because they get canceled and prices rise on the remaining things that bundle are becoming increasingly inaccessible, um, unfortunately, whereas open access journals are completely accessible. Anybody can get access to it. That's the whole point. Um, on the other hand, the subscription journals of the world are fully underwritten to the extent that they're underwritten, that the revenues are underwritten through a system that has a quite a sophisticated market structure. It's been well worked out over many decades. We have uh, uh, we settled out on libraries being the purchasers. No one, almost no one subscribes individually to journals anymore. Libraries are the purchasers. The publishers are the uh, providers. There's a relatively efficient uh, series of uh, subscription agents who are negotiating the process between them, and it's all kind of worked out uh, how that all works. 
And uh, whereas in the case of open access journals, they're very poorly underwritten. Uh, uh, and that has a really bad effect. The, the um, uh, open access journals from the author point of view, and of course, it's the author who's the customer for an open access journal. It's not the reader, it's the author, in terms of where the money flows. From the author's point of view, open access journals have an inherent disadvantage. Namely, you have to pay a publication fee. Uh, whereas for the vast majority of subscription journals, you don't. There are exceptions. At the highest tier of the life sciences, subscription journals, you tend to pay a fair amount of money. But other than there, uh, and that, by the way, is where you see the bulk of the high-end open access journals, because the people <coughs> in that field are used to paying publication fees. So they're very poorly underwritten. That puts them at a distinct disadvantage. And there's very little market structure. People haven't worked out the mechanisms for a kind of deal. So, um, so there's these various problems. On the subscription side, there's the problem of increasing inaccessibility. And on the open access side, there's the problem of poor underwriting and little market structure. So let me talk about those uh, separately. So what do we do at the moment about the fact that subscription journals are increasingly inaccessible? Uh, well, it would be nice if what we did as authors is publish in open access journals. But there aren't very many of them. There may be none in someone's particular field. In any case, you can't tell people where to publish. I mean, it's, it's just not uh, appropriate and arguably a violation of academic freedom to tell people they have to publish in an open access journal. Um, uh, as nice as that would be. So for the time being, uh, we have to uh, come up with some solution to this inaccessibility problem for the subscription journal. And the approach uh, that um, uh, University of Torino has taken, uh, and hopefully the Polytechnic will take at some point, soon, and that the Italian uh, government as funding agency uh, is beginning to take is a requirement to um, deposit copies of articles in some kind of repository that makes the articles available to the extent it has the rights to do so. So this is the recent um, clauses from the um, uh, new um, Young Investigator Program, the Italian Young Investigator Program, that says that um, articles funded by uh, these kinds of research grants have to be put into an, uh, a repository and made available within a certain uh, period of time. They allow for embargoes of, I think, uh, six months or a year. Uh, but uh, in rel within a relatively short period of time, the articles become available, uh, openly accessible, not through the mechanism I've been talking about, not through open access journals, but through this supplementary kind of open access. And as a stopgap measure, I think this is really the way to go, to solve the inaccessibility problem. It's a little surprising you should have to require people to do this. Uh, I mean, the majority of publishers actually allow authors to place copies of their articles in an open access repository and distribute them. Why wouldn't an author take advantage of that fact? It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a deep mystery, but it seems to be the case that unless you require it, and even if you require it, authors don't do it. Uh, I don't know. Someone can explain it to me. But in the meantime, I think the thing to do is to is to uh, <coughs> excuse me to require a deposit in the open access repository. So that's the first recommendation that universities and uh, funders set up open access policies that require deposit of author manuscripts and um, and then and of course distribution if, if possible. You know, hopefully within a limited period of time, 
short embargo period. And then optionally, something that we've done at, uh, at Harvard is to have a, a system of uh, default rights retention. So part of the problem with these kinds of deposits into repositories is there's always an issue of what rights do you have. You've signed some contract with a publisher, and it says something or other. Who knows what? The, the authors never read them. Uh, and uh, you know they're so freaked out by the legal language that they just sign whatever it is. And then who knows if you're allowed to distribute the thing or not. So uh, the solution that we came up with in the Harvard open access policy is a system of default rights retention. So here's the Harvard access policy, open access policy in kind of caricature. First, uh, well, third, I guess, is this deposit requirement. Every faculty commits to uh, provide a copy of their article. We put it in this dash repository. I'll show in a second. We put it in this dash repository, and we distribute it to the extent that we have rights. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do after six months or a year. Whatever it is, that's how we distribute it. That's the deposit part. That's like the deposit part of the Young Investigator Program or the Torino uh, mandate. I hate calling these things mandates, because they're not really mandates. You can't mandate faculty to do anything. You said Harvard. I don't know about Torino. My guess is you can, you can tell the faculty they have to do something, but it doesn't mean they'll do it. <laughs> but, so, but they're supposed to do it. They're supposed to provide it. But then the first the first part is a permission uh, that the faculty provide to the university. So faculty grant a non-exclusive license to the university to exercise copyright in the article. And the idea here is this is a trick to um, obtain author rights retention. So it might not seem like rights retention if you're giving a non-exclusive license to somebody else. But it is, and I'll explain why in a second. So non-exclusive license to the university in all of our articles, that license happens the moment copyright vests in the article. So as you're writing the article, putting pen to paper or fingers to keyboard, copyright vests in the article, and the university has a license for that article. The university can't do anything with the license because it doesn't have a copy of the article yet. That's part three. But but in theory, the university has this license. So then let's say later you transfer copyright to a publisher after it's gone through the whole peer review process and, and uh, uh, updates and, and so on and so forth. So now the situation is you as the author have no rights. The publisher has all of the copyright, but subject to this prior non-exclusive license to the university, the university still has this, uh, uh, this non-exclusive license. And, and that's true regardless of what it says in the contract. The contract says I transfer all the rights. Um, the university already has this non-exclusive license. They're not a party to the agreement between you and the publisher. So now, uh, the other point is that in this license that we make, the faculty grant to the university, the license is a transferable license. It's explicit in the policy. It's a transferable license, which means the university can and does transfer the license back to the author. So the net effect is that even though you've assigned the entire copyright <coughs> to the publisher, you receive back this non-exclusive license from the university. And it's as if you've retained rights to your work by doing nothing. It's a beautiful thing. So uh, now, we want that uh, license, that ret rights retention, to be controlled by the author. In fact, it's, a, it's part of this principle of academic freedom. If you don't want there to be a license to the university, there shouldn't be one. If you don't want to retain rights, you shouldn't be forced to. So we, this is the second part. We say that you can get a waiver of this license for any reason at your sole discretion. No one else can stop you from getting a license. You just directed a, li sorry, a waiver. 
you direct that the waiver be granted and it's granted. And so um, the, um, the upshot is that we just change the default. By default, you retain rights unless you don't want to. Then you can get a waiver. So now, instead of you having to go do something overt, like negotiating with a publisher to retain rights, which nobody ever did, really, except for me. Um, I used to do that all the time. Um, but now the situation is you retain rights unless you do something overt, namely get a waiver. And the waiver rate is exceptionally low. It's not surprising. So uh, this has the nice effect that if you do nothing at all, you have the rights to distribute the articles from a repository, independently of what the publisher would like. So that's been a huge boon. Uh, and this idea of the um, default rights retention open access policy has been taken up by uh, a bunch of other, but there's now eight of the nine, uh, eight of the nine schools at Harvard and a bunch of other uh, universities throughout the world, including places like MIT and Duke and uh, uh, Princeton and lots of, lots of uh, universities. This is an old list, there's even more than this. So what happens is we then put these articles in a depository, the Dash depository that Juan Carlos mentioned. And um, we started, the policy started in 2008, almost exactly six years ago. And the repository started, uh, as you can see, in around 2009, or just before 2010. And um, the uh, number of downloads has been dramatically increasing since then. The articles, there, there are now uh, something like, I think, 15,000 articles in the repository that have been downloaded something like two and a half million times. So this shows that there is tremendous demand for these articles that is not satisfied by the subscription journals in which they occur. So, um, um, yeah, for instance, here's, here's a map of the downloads. Um, and we've had downloads from, this map shows, so the green is, the, uh, the countries that are in green are the countries where we have seen downloads. And the darkness of the green is, corresponds to the number of downloads. It's very hard to find any countries that are not green. There's one so up at the very top. The very top up there, that's Svalbard. We have yet to see a single download from Svalbard. So if any of you plan on vacationing in Svalbard, while you're there, if you could download something like that. <laughs> We've had downloads from every continent, uh, including, not shown on the map, Antarctica. We had one download from Antarctica. And I tell you, I had to go down to Antarctica myself. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I don't know who it was. But somebody from Antarctica downloaded a dash article. Uh, so there's a lot of demand for the articles. And, and again, surprising that people don't do this voluntarily, but maybe if they didn't have to worry about the rights issue, it would be beneficial. OK, so that's, in the short term, increasing access to these articles is a good thing. Uh, at least, it doesn't solve the underlying problem. It has nothing to do with the underlying problem. But at least people will be able to read the articles. Now, um, some people worry that if all of these articles were available in repositories like that, and were easy to find, and they are easy to find, uh, that's not because of anything that Harvard does in running its repository or uh, or any of the other universities do. It's because of what Google does. It makes it very easy to find. Um, the vast majority of hits on our, deposit, uh, on our um, repository are from Google. So the worry is that once these articles are easy to access, 
uh, that might uh, put the journals in jeopardy because people would no longer need to read the journals as distributed by the publisher. They could read the versions distributed by the authors. And this would decrease demand for the journal subscriptions and therefore put price pressure on the publishers. And that would be, people say, a bad thing. Never quite understood why they think that's a bad thing, why price pressure on publishers is a bad thing. I would think it's a good thing. But I, I can, you know, the argument is there would be so much price pressure that the journals would be unable to recoup their costs and would have to go out of business. So it turns out that we do have a lot of access through this mechanism, and there's no evidence. I won't go through the details, but it turns out there is no evidence of uh, any cancellations of journals based on this kind of open access, this supplemental open access through repositories. So empirically, it doesn't seem to be a valid word. Nonetheless, it doesn't stop people from worrying. And personally, it doesn't seem like an important thing. <coughs> um, OK, so that's the first thing we could do. Uh, the second thing we could do is uh, to provide underwriting for the open access journals. We provide underwriting for the subscription journals. Nobody refers to subscription journals as the reader pays model. And yet, for open access journals, people always talk about the author pays model. Well, the reason uh, you know, publishers don't refer to their journals as reader paid is that sounds scary. But, you know, readers don't want to pay. Um, also, for the most part, the readers aren't paying. It's the libraries that are paying on behalf of the readers. Well, similarly, open access journals needn't be author pays, they can be institutions pay on behalf of the authors, just like institutions pay on behalf of the readers. That's how it should work. And this gets to the, this first principle that I mentioned before, that dissemination of the research results uh, should be funded by the research funders. It's part of the research, the dissemination is part of the research. So if you're a funder, you need to be on the hook to pay the dissemination costs, $1,200 or whatever it is. You're already on the hook to pay the reader pays fee. The universities of the world and the funding agencies of the world already pay $5,000 per article to the publishers through, in the case of universities, library uh, subscriptions, and in the case of funding agencies, overheads that go to pay the libraries to pay the subscriptions. So the funding agencies and universities, the institutions that fund research in the world, already pay on the reader side. They should pay on the author side. And so that's a uh, recommendation too, that <coughs> funding, uh, research funders, and I mean that very broadly. I don't just mean uh, granting agencies. You'll see in a second. Research funders should provide incremental, non-fungible, non -fungible, optional grants to their fundees, to the people they fund, to reimburse reasonable publication fees in open access journals. Certainly, if you get a grant from a funding agency, the granting agency should be willing to do this. I say certainly, although they don't. <laughs> Yeah, but they. It's yeah. funny to know what you mean by reasonable. Reasonable, reasonable. yeah. Yes. Okay. I know, I know what it means, but what's the yeah. top? Yeah, so let me get back to The reasonable on publication fee. And then I have another yes. question. How was the permission policy, our permission policy, accepted by researchers at first? I mean, I've seen all the, yeah. the statistics there going higher and higher. Yeah. But what, what, what's the first reaction of this permission policy? So, um, okay, so let me take the second question first. Okay. So, uh, um, 
I, so I have to tell you, there was a long process before the vote of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in February of 2008. There was a long process, about two years, of talking with various uh, uh, faculty groups. Uh, and it worked in different ways in different parts of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, mostly through group meetings of, uh, of um, uh, chairs of departments. Of, we have uh, something called a faculty council, which is an elected subset of around 20 faculty that represent the about eight or 900 faculty in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. We met with them on four different occasions. Now the council, all, which is unprecedented. The, uh, the typical um, issue that comes before the full faculty. So this was a vote of the entire faculty. But uh, before there's a vote of the faculty, it, it's always brought before the faculty council. But usually one meeting of the faculty council. I've never, I used to be on the faculty council. I've never heard of a case where something came before the faculty council four times. Uh, t twice is sometimes, you sometimes see twice. Um, and, uh, and, and th this was in part because it took so long. To, in fact, the kept changing, so they wanted to see it again. Uh, uh, chairs, groups, individual departments, meeting with individual departments, sometimes even meeting with individual faculty members. So it was a long process. We had, uh, uh, and then it came before the full faculty twice. Once for discussion and once for the further discussion in a vote. In between those two meetings, there were open, there were two open forums that anyone in the university could attend to ask questions. And so there was a lot of attempt for outreach to faculty before the vote occurred. Nonetheless, um, there's a difference between voting something and then seeing how it really works. And, uh, you know, I, the vast majority of faculty, I think, are kind of oblivious. Even after all of this, we're kind of oblivious of what is going on. So, um, there has been a long process of uh, helping faculty work through uh, dealing with this. Now, we're aided by a couple of things. First, in our policy, unlike the Torino policy, there's rights retention built in. So some of the problems of, you know, can we distribute it or not, are simplified. Second, we have an office that was established dedicated to supporting these open access policies. I have to say it's a very small office. And it's not nearly big enough to do all the support we need, so we've leveraged that by trying to bring in people, mostly from the library, to serve as liaisons to faculty. We have a monthly meeting of faculty liaisons, of library liaisons, that do outreach to all the schools. And we meet monthly to keep everybody on track and talk about problems and all that kind of thing. And we also leverage things by uh, technology where possible. Um, early on, when, when the office was first established, um, a lot of the tracking of things we needed computer systems to do. And although it was not the most, and we, all, we originally had one and a half people in the office. I was the half. So I was half time. <laughs> in the office, I was half time doing my teaching and research. And we also had a program manager uh, who was full time. And that was it. But eventually, we worked up to three and a half people in steady state. Um, but, um, uh, and, and, and then we started, we, we needed a developer to work on the repository. We had no repository. This is the other thing. We passed this policy that said you have to provide a copy for the repository, but we had no repository. <laughs> so we had to develop a repository. Um, and so we had a developer doing that, but the developer was busy doing that, and we wanted some technology to do some tracking and so forth. So believe it or not, um, for that purpose, I ended up writing the software to do the traffic. So this is the advantage of having a computer scientist as the faculty director of the office, 
is that they can write some software. But it's not, if you've seen the kind of, I used to be a pretty good programmer, but that, those times have long passed. I'm not the right person to be writing the software. We now have professional staff, a much larger professional staff to deal with. Though, so, I mean, we kind of ran on a shoestring, you know, and still do. It's, 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 it's hard. And, we're, and we don't have, you know, 100% of the articles that should be going into the repository, we don't have. And we never will. To a certain extent, it's more than you can hope for. You know, it's a good idea, this policy notwithstanding, it's a good idea for faculty to be doing this kind of distribution. And if we have a policy, and we help with their rights retention, and we have an office, and they still won't do it, you know, it's their funeral, as we say. I don't know, that probably doesn't translate. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, there's no magic. Uh, it's just keep plugging away. We spend a lot of time trying to get uh, things in the face of faculty, remind them. So, uh, well, I don't know how, I can give you. I can give you all kinds of. Maybe afterwards, I'll give you all kinds of details about how, what we do to try to get it to be part of the process that they provide these articles. I think we, I should, we should wrap up. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, this would be a good idea. Um, I just wanted to mention that we put our money where our mouth is. So, um, we established. A, uh, uh, we established a. Uh, a compact, the compact for open access publishing equity that says we as universities will provide uh, uh, underwriting of reasonable publication charges. And this was originally this commitment. Uh, we're saying we understand that it's not free to run journals, open access journals or otherwise, and we're willing to pay reasonable fees to, uh, to underwrite them. This was originally a group of five uh, universities, Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, MIT, and Berkeley. And since then, uh, a bunch of other universities have signed on, and there's another 30 uh, institutions that, although they haven't signed the compact, they run open access funds in ways compatible with this compact. So we now have a fund, all these universities have funds that will underwrite publication fees. And now the question of what is reasonable. So. <coughs> Different universities take different approaches on what's reasonable. So I can tell you what we do at Harvard. At Harvard, we um, pretty much leave it up to the authors uh, what's reasonable. We trust their judgment as to what's a plausible uh, journal, although we do have some criteria. So we say, for instance, that the journals have to be um, members of the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, or that, that's, that's way too restricted. Uh, it has very few members, as it turns out. Or it has to abide by their rules of conduct. So, uh, um, for instance, you may be aware of this phenomenon of what are sometimes called predatory open access journals. So these are not real journals. They're they're kind of um, they're kind of a con game uh, going under the name of a journal, and um, you don't want to be supporting those. And for the most part, we don't need to worry about it because our faculty don't want to publish in those journals. So it's not really a big problem. But in theory, if we wanted to avoid it. None of those journals abide by the code of conduct of the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association. So, um, in practice, it hasn't been an issue, but putting some restrictions of that sort on, on what's a reasonable journal. Then there's what's a reasonable fee. Again, it, it hasn't been a big issue, but we do want to have some kind of limitation. So what we do is we say we have a cap of uh, a fixed um, a, um, amount of funding per author per year. At the moment, it's set at $3,000. It might go higher over time if there were demand. The demand on these funds is very low, I have to say. Again, because there's so few open access journals. Um, 
costs us almost nothing to run this fund, which is a good reason for Torino and Polytechnic to set up a fund like this if you haven't already. It costs almost nothing, and it, and it uh, makes a big statement. Um, so $3,000, and we do it not per article, we do it per year, because it, uh, it generates a price signal to the authors. You can publish one article in PLOS Biology for $3,000. You can probably publish two Biomed Central articles, probably three or four Hindawi articles. And so as an author, you're in, now in this position of deciding, should I use all of my funds for this one class article, or should I do two uh, uh, Biomed Central? You know, is the quality that, of services I get worth the extra money? And when you make a decision, trading off dollars for quality, that's a market. That's exactly what's missing from the subscription side. So it has the effect of limiting, it has the effect of saying what we mean by reasonable, $3,000, but it also has the effect of eliminating the moral hazard that you might get from underwriting the fees. There are other, by the way, there's other ways of getting rid of the moral hazard. This is just one of them. So, so, so that was the second point was, uh, second recommendation is funding agencies and universities should do this. It's very important. And then there's the business of market structure. Uh, and there I've paid less attention, mostly because I think this is a problem that will solve itself. If there was reasonable <coughs> underwriting of open access fees, uh, market structure would appear just from the process of entrepreneurial people doing what they do. And again, we're already seeing examples of this. We're seeing the equivalent of subscription agents on the author side. It started with a company called Open Access Key. I don't know if people are familiar with it. And now the big subscription agents are moving into this now. EBSCO is starting to uh, look into efforts on building some market mechanisms for open access and things like that. They see the future is on that side of the market. So I'm not worried about that. I think this is the least of the problems. The big problems are the, are the first two. Okay, I'll stop there. I'll just put up my advertisement for the uh, various uh, sites that I've uh, mentioned. Thank you. Per non sporre troppo dei, dei tempi, diciamo, abbiamo ancora 5-10 minuti al massimo per eventuali domande con il nostro ospite. Prego.
He's not going to do it for a book. So um, that's harder. And there, uh, um, I don't know. I made, I, I, I made various proposals. I tried to work with Harvard University Press a bit on this. Nothing ever much came of it. There are beginning to be some efforts of various sorts. It depends on what kind of what they're talking about. Textbooks are different from monographs. One of the interesting approaches is this program called Knowledge Unlatched. Do you know about Knowledge Unlatched? So Knowledge Unlatched is a group. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a, 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 a program that was set up uh, by um, Francis Tinker of Bloomsbury, the publisher of Bloomsbury, to provide a different mechanism for funding first copy costs of scholarly books. <coughs> And the mechanism is this. Uh, they would get a bunch of libraries, university libraries, academic libraries in a consortium. They would put together a prospectus describing a bunch of books. And the libraries would say whether or not they would uh, participate in underwriting the first copy cost of the book. That's not just for the US. No, no. In fact, it's a British, uh, it's a British effort, but it's worldwide. <coughs> so, the, so they're working, on one side they're working with publishers who have these potential books. And then they're working with libraries where the potential you know, recipients of the books. And if they can, if, so they get the proposals from the publishers, they push them to the libraries, the libraries say whether they'll support them or not. If the libraries will support them, they uh, they distribute the first copy costs to the, this, these libraries, so the costs end up being to the library. So the libraries are funding the first copy costs, but no particular university has to pay the large charge, the large first copy costs, which I think they estimate it on the order of twelve to fifteen thousand um, dollars. They're paying a small amount of money, something like what a copy of the book would cost. If they get enough buy-in from the libraries to cover the first copy cost of the book, then they will do the book and distribute open access. So the pro so it's a nice model in certain respects. It distributes first copy costs among institutions that are already used to paying these kinds of fees to libraries. The problem with the model, which maybe you see, is the free rider problem. Because once they commit, you know, if a bunch of libraries say they'll cover the cost, then uh, the book will be made open access. So whether you participated in paying for that book or not, you still get access. So the, the big question with that program is how to handle the how to handle the free rider problem, and their approach is to provide to the libraries that participate for a particular book, um, certain added value services. Uh, it's not exactly clear what those will be, but better, uh, better electronic copies that have additional functionality or uh, better interfaces or something. There's going to be some kind of value added services to provide incentive for libraries to participate. So it's an interesting idea. It's just getting underway. They haven't completed their first uh, um, kind of call for books yet. percentage of papers that the faculty write that show up in Dash. And then there's the percentage of the papers that are in Dash that are open access. Because not all the papers in Dash are open access. Um, and the reason is that uh, we can only distribute any paper that faculty write can go in, or students for that matter, can go into Dash. But we can only distribute if we have rights. If so for instance, for me, I'm a member of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Anything I wrote after February of 2008, I have retained rights. So those can all be distributed. But things from before 2008, 
I may or may not have rights. And I've put in all of my articles back to 1981 or something. Uh, now, as it turns out, all of my articles, I do have rights, just because for the last 30-something years, I've been negotiating with publishers. I'm just crazy about it. But a lot of articles you can't distribute, so we just put them in dark. I actually don't know what percentage of articles in Dash are dark. It's, uh, my guess is it's a minority. Uh, I, 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 if I were just to hazard a guess, I would say 20%, something like that, are dark. But I, I, it could be 5, it could be 40. I, I don't really, I should know, but I don't. Then there's the question of what percentage of articles that Faculty of Arts and Sciences faculty who are under this policy that commits them to providing their articles, what percentage of those articles actually get submitted to Dash? Again, it's hard to know because it's, we know the numerator extremely well, namely however many articles are in the FAS collection. But we don't know the denominator. We don't know how many articles faculty have written. We can do some subsampling. I, 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 again, I don't want to give firm numbers, especially if there's a video camera operating. But it's low. I would say it's low. Uh, so, um, you know, it's in the low double digits or something. Uh, so why is that? It's because people aren't giving us the articles. The, the, the policy says, yeah, I think you were talking about this. So the policy says you have to do it. <coughs> but if they don't do it, we don't go breaking into their office and trying to build it. But it's, it's much higher than it was before we had the policy, when it was zero. <laughs> Uh, I have a Alessandro question about Matogo, uh, the <coughs> I have a question about the waiver system. Yeah. Uh, you have an automatic grant unless the author asks for a waiver. waiver yeah. But you start from the assumption that the author needs such a system because <coughs> he doesn't read the publishing agreements. So maybe he's still not asking waivers uh, just because he doesn't read the, the publishing agreements. So you, he's, not perf he's performing the uh, uh, yes. policy of the university because he's not uh, performing his uh, publishing agreements. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's right. So, 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 so what I said was that part of the policy has the effect of, by default, retaining rights. So we have the rights to distribute the articles regardless of what the publishing agreement says. But what you're pointing out is that that's not the end of the story. Because if the publishing agreement says you, as the author, transfer copyright in its entirety, without exception, to the publisher, you didn't do that. Right? You, you transferred the copyright subject to a non-exclusive license. So, in theory, under this theory, you would be in breach of contract. Yeah. Now, the various things we said here. First, uh, under the old system, what people, the kind of people who don't read their contracts are also the kind of people who put their papers up on their website without reading their contracts. And in that case, they were also in breach of contract. But also, they were in violation of copyright. So now at least, you're only in breach of contract, <laughs> not in violation of copyright. And it's a lot uh, better to be in breach of contract than to be in violation of copyright. Especially in the United States. Especially in the United States, yeah. So uh, the, 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 the uh, damages are not even comparable. So, so under that theory, you would be in breach of contract. Now, I have to say um, that there's another theory under which you would not be in breach of contract. And that is based on the uh, predicate that uh, if the prior non-exclusive license is widely known to exist, even though it's not acknowledged in the contract, um, it would essentially be implicit in the contract. And it's safe to say that among publishers, 
the Harvard open access policy is widely known to exist. The reason we know that is we heard, you know, a lot of, from a lot of press and pub, you know, publishers, and people know that this is going on. So under that theory, there isn't even a breach of contract. Nobody knows which theory is right. It's never gone to court. I think it's highly unlikely it would ever go to court. But if it were, then, then some judge would have to decide what is the, what is the situation for those cases where there's a, a breach of contract. What I think is that we're trying with all efforts to go towards a, a new standard publishing agreement where we have a, a, a license. Yeah. So what we tell, right. so what we tell uh, One authors. One way or the other, we're trying to go the same. Same. Right. So what, but, but, so what we tell authors is that the right thing to do isn't to get a waiver. If the, if the contract is uh, at least prima facie in contrast to the policy, we don't say what you should do is get a waiver. Why get a waiver? Change the contract. So what we do is we provide an addendum that they can attach to, the, to any publication contract that makes the contract consistent with our policy. And uh, it's a very simple process to, to um, you fill in a web form with the name of the article and your, your name and that kind of thing. It generates the addendum, which you print out and staple to the publication agreement. So for those people who are worried about the risk of breach of contract, we provide a mechanism to resolve it. It's safe to say that very few people use that mechanism. Why? Because faculty are just lazy. <laughs> it's the laziness that we're leveraging to yes. do the right thing. Okay, I think we could go on a long time uh, talking about uh, many complex issues about open access, but we should stop here so that people who have other engagements can move on. So thank you again to all of you for participating, and thank you, Professor Schieber, for his presentation. Thank you.